this week's motoring news show, we get red. Really, really red. Find that speed doesn't actually kill you. But getting off while the ride is still in motion can hurt. And see a legless racer return to racing. All this and more in this week's Drive. A freezing red square in Moscow isn't where you'd expect to find a modern Formula One car. But with Formula One enjoying immense popularity in Russia, the surprise of passing Muscovites turned to delight at the realization that not only was this the genuine article, but that the car was accompanied by both the team's drivers, Fernando Alonso and Jano Trulli. They will take their cars to the streets of Moscow in an exhibition race which comes at the end of a tremendous season for the team and their young drivers. It was fantastic for us. We achieved uh, better results than we expected. We had uh, five podiums in the team, one victory. So, you know, we are really happy and very confident for next year to do another step. What are you personally planning to do next year? Uh, next year, uh, you know, uh, the new car should be better, more competitive, and uh, I hope to, to fight with the top teams for more victories opportunities. While in Moscow, the drivers learned that the team's technical director, Mike Gascoigne, has decided to leave Renault for Toyota. Well, we are still on top, I think, of it. And, uh, you know, Mike Gascoigne has done a very great, great job, so we wish him all the best. But uh, I think Renault has got great potential, great engineers, which will replace him. And we are confident that we can uh, still improve our car and our performance to be very competitive again next year. Renault emerged as a force to be reckoned with this season, finishing fourth in the constructors' standings. Spaniard Alonso, at 22 years of age, is one of the sport's rising stars. He came sixth in the driver's standings, while his Italian teammate Trulli was eighth. Alonso became the youngest driver ever to start from pole in Malaysia and the youngest to record a Grand Prix win in Hungary. Despite speculation linking him to other teams, he says he's happy where he is and is hoping to win his first world title with Renault soon. Uh, you know, I don't think... Uh... At the moment, in, uh, in another teams, I'm very concentrated with the project in Renault. As Jarno said, it's a very long-term con uh, uh, contract, and uh, you know, uh, our main goal is to, to win the World Championship again, like Renault did in the in the 90s. And you know, I'm very young, and uh, they are supporting me. I have confidence in them. After Gascoigne's surprise departure, these are words that the team will be glad to hear. The NASCAR Circus travelled to North Carolina for the United Auto Workers GM Quality 500. Ryan Newman started on pole, but was soon down to fourth. The first caution of the night came out when Kurt Busch spun out on the 86th lap while running in 16th place. Busch would keep racing, only to hit the wall hard on the 232nd lap. Elliot Sadler in the M&M's Ford was involved in yet another crash marking the third consecutive week he is lined up for an early shower. On lap 206, Sadler moved up on Todd Bodine, but when he got close, the disrupted airflow at the back of his car made Bodine lose control of his Ford without physical contact, spinning out and kissing Sadler as he slipped by, sending him headfirst into the wall. Three weeks ago at Talladega, Sadler was involved in an even more spectacular crash. Newman had an eight-second lead when Tony Stewart got back on the track after his stop, and Stewart had 36 laps to run him down. But with four fresh tyres, Stewart was much faster and slowly chipped into Newman's lead. Stewart was on Newman's bumper with 10 laps to go, pulled alongside with seven laps to go, then passed him for the lead in the second turn. He was in the clear from there, piloting the number 20 Chevrolet to an easy win over Newman. Stewart beat Newman and Jimmy Johnson, trying to become the first driver to win all three events here in the same year. Championship leader Matt Kenseth finished eighth to gain some ground in the title. He now has a 267 points advantage over Kevin Harvick with five races remaining. The season-ending race for the Indy Racing League got off to a clean start with Sam Hornish Jr. on pole position with a lap of 23.3 seconds at over 224 miles an hour. On lap 98, Alex Barron was involved in an accident with Felipe Giafone, and Barron hit the outside wall hard.
Veteran Gilles de Ferrin announced that he would retire after this race, but he drove like he was racing for his first victory. New Zealand's Scott Dixon was racing for the championship. He started the race tied with Helio Castroneves in points and finished second to take the title. Then, with just 12 laps left, Sweden's Kenny Brack tangled with South African Thomas Schechter, son of 1979 Formula One world champion Jody. Brack was fourth when he tried to pass Schechter on the back straight of the 1.5-mile oval. Brack's left front tyre touched Schechter's right rear, sending him up and over and into the catch fence at over 220 miles an hour. The car broke into hundreds of pieces, with Brack in the cockpit tub sliding to a stop on the inside of the track. Incredibly, Brack was conscious and alert when taken to hospital by helicopter. He suffered fractures in his right thigh, sternum, lower back and both ankles and underwent 15 hours of surgery on Sunday evening and was initially listed in a serious but stable condition, but has since improved. Getting ready to take off with Kenny Breck on board. He'll be taken to... DeFerrin had to drive into the infield grass to avoid debris on the track and made an extra pit stop. The race was shortened to five more laps and ended behind the safety car, with DeFerrin the winner and Scott Dixon right behind him in second place. Runner-up was enough to give Dixon the IRL championship, and he was presented with a ceremonial check for $1 million. Nice work if you can get it. Deferrin finished second in the points battle. You know, they knew all year that we could that we could win races, we could dominate. And we had so many opportunities where, you know, we were leading, we had small, niggly little problems that sort of stopped us from doing it. And I think, you know, without those, the championship would have been over a couple of, a couple of races ago. And uh, I don't know, I'm just so happy. Uh, for the team, they've worked so hard. It's awesome. Dan Wielden finished third, winning Rookie of the Year honours. Brack was classified 14th in the final race and placed ninth in the final championships. Italian Alex Zanardi made a comeback to racing in the final round of the European Touring Car Championship, two years after losing his legs in a near-fatal crash in a champ car race in Germany. Driving a specially converted BMW, Zanardi qualified 11th. The car has the throttle on the steering wheel and the clutch on the gear shift. In the first of the two races, which would decide the overall winner of the Touring Car Championship, Zanardi was unable to avoid a multi-car pileup, sustaining damage which forced him to retire from the heat. In the second race, Zanardi finished a creditable seventh. His teammate, Jörg Müller of Germany, won the heat but was beaten to the overall title by third-place finisher Gabriel Tarquini of Italy in an Alfa Romeo. Both drivers scored the same number of points, but Tarquini took the title by virtue of having won one more race than Müller this season. Like Zanardi and Tarquini, fourth-placed Nicola Larini is also an ex-Formula 1 driver. Championship leader Paul Tracy started from pole in Mexico, and his rival, Bruno Junquira, was almost out with an upset stomach, but was good to go by the time the green flag waved. Tracy managed to avoid drama at the very first turn as the leading pack raced into the corner three and four abreast. Adrian Fernandez and Michel Jourdain were both forced to cut across the grass. Fernandez to avoid a spinning Jimmy Vassa, and Jourdain to miss Englishman Darren Manning. Second of the rookie championship. A couple of those key laps. Later, the race was tightened up by a yellow flag that came out on the 40th of 70 laps. Former champion Vassa was right out of luck again as he lost grip, slid across the track, and was hit by Alex Tagliani, taking them both out. Tracy built an eight second lead over Junquira before the second pit stop, where rookie Sebastian Bourdais beat Junquira out of the pits to claim second place, clinching Rookie of the Year honours and pressuring Tracy for the final 32 laps, who won by just over a second at an average of 100 miles an hour. Tracy, who led for all but six laps, took the chequered flag for his 26th career victory, which tied him for third on Kart's career list with Rick Mears, a three time champion. Scoring his seventh win of the year matches the tally of Zanardi in 1998, Juan Pablo Montoya in 99 and Cristiano De Mata in 2002. With points for the victory and most laps led, Tracy now leads the standings with 226 points, 29 points clear of Junquira.
It's probably fair to say that Porsche is a name known to all enthusiasts and admired by most, making their trademark high-performance rear-engine sports cars. The original 911 Turbo entered production in 1975, and the normally aspirated 911 SC Cabrio was conceived six years later, with a turbo version appearing in 1987. By the time it ceased production in July 1989, just 1,800 had been built, and it's taken until now for Stuttgart to take the plunge into high-powered drop tops. This is the 12th distinct variation of the current model 911 Carrera theme, the 189 mile an hour four-wheel drive turbo cabriolet, launched barely a month after the essentially very similar Carrera 4S Cabrio featured in drive just a few weeks ago. The removal of the roof and replacing it with 360-degree sunshine is very neatly executed. The car combines the lower body of the 911 Turbo Coupe with the folding roof of the 911 Cabrio. So you get the Turbo's aggressive, bulging rear wheel arches and numerous air intakes, combined with the obvious attractions of on-demand exposure to the elements. There are a few clues to help distinguish the turbo from the much cheaper 4S. The turbo versions have big air intakes in the leading edge of the rear wing, which feed air to the intercoolers that cool the air going into the twin turbochargers. The large rear spoiler has a movable section that rises at 120 km an hour to aid high-speed stability. Much like the turbo coupe, a 3.6-litre flat six-cylinder engine powers the cabrio version, and power output is 420 horsepower a hundred more than the 4S, thanks to the two large turbochargers. Not surprisingly, the 911 Cabrio Turbo is a very quick car, hitting 100 km an hour in 4.3 seconds, 160 in 9.5, and reaching over 300 km an hour at the top end. Power is put to the ground with a six-speed manual transmission and through all four wheels. Much like the 4S Cabrio, the Turbo has a quick operating soft top roof. So long as the car is traveling at speeds under 50 kilometers an hour, the roof will readily retract in less than 20 seconds. Porsche will offer 32 kilogram aluminum hardtop roof for the turbo cabrio. Expect to pay a heavy premium over the current 911 turbo. Porsche is asking 138,600 euro, a 12,500 euro rise over the coupe. The Phillip Island circuit is on the very southern edge of Australia, and sudden changes in the weather are common. But before the race, talk in the pits concerned Valentino Rossi's plans for next year, as his decision to remain with Honda or move to Yamaha will ripple throughout the paddock. American Suzuki rider John Hopkins was sanctioned for a first corner incident at Motegi when he crashed into Carlos Checa and Troy Bayless and declared his intent to make up for lost time. He likes this track and tested here at the beginning of the season. Warm and sunny weather on the first day of qualifying didn't mean it was a good day for newly crowned 125 world champion Danny Pedrosa of Spain, who broke both his ankles in a nasty practice crash. The teenager, who had wrapped up his first world title just five days before at Sepang in Malaysia, was airlifted to hospital in Melbourne. Whilst the fracture on his right ankle is clean, the left ankle was badly twisted and doctors predict a recovery period of up to 40 days before he can begin to walk, definitely ruling him out of his home race at Valencia, the final Grand Prix of the season. Although he should be fit in time for the intense winter testing period at the start of next year, when he is expected to make his debut aboard a 250cc machine. With Pedrosa out, Jorge Lorenzo claimed pole in an all-teenage 125 front row, which included Hector Barbera, Marco Simoncelli, and local hope Casey Stoner. The first practice session for MotoGP also saw Spain's Sete Gibbonau take a dive. He was third quickest before falling off and walked away unhurt, riding his spare bike later on. Another rider who didn't fare too well was Japan's Nobi Aoki. He was taken to a local hospital for x-rays after injuring his neck in this practice crash. At the front of the pack, world champ Rossi took provisional pole position. The 24-year-old smashed his own lap record set last year by almost two seconds with his last lap run to the front of the grid, ahead of the red Ducatis of fellow Italian Loris Caparossi and Australian MotoGP rookie Troy Bayliss. 
Bayliss won both the World Superbike Championship races at the circuit last year and raced here many times before heading for the World Series. Pedrosa's team was given a boost in the 250cc session when Sebastian Porto took provisional pole position. The Argentinian dedicated the results to his young teammate after scorching to the top of the timesheets with two quick laps at the end of the session. In final qualifying the next day, Rossi lowered the mark by almost a half a second further to claim his eighth pole of the year, but his first in Australia. Valentino has won 14 times from his last 18 pole starts. His time was the fastest ever lap of a Phillip Island circuit by a motorcycle, more than 1.8 seconds quicker than Jeremy McWilliams' pole from last year. 17 riders lapped faster than last year's pole time. Loris Caparossi, second on the grid, would be making his 50th career front row start in the premier class of Grand Prix racing. Sete Gibbonau split the Ducatis. If he finished 14th or higher, he'd have scored more points coming second than any other rider. Troy Bayliss would start fourth from the front row for the first time since qualifying second in Spain back in May. His local knowledge of the track was expected to give him an edge. Spaniard Tony Elias, who's won three of the last four 250cc races, grabbed his fifth consecutive pole on his final lap, never having previously held pole in the class. Elias has scored five wins this year, more than anyone else. Provisional pole starter Sebastian Porto was bumped to second, but is still looking for his first podium finish. Franco Battaini started a strong charge, and his effort was enough for third, ahead of Randy de Punier with Fonzi Nieto fifth on the second row. Italy's Aprilia rider Stefano Perugini capitalized on Pedrosa's absence to take pole position in the closing minutes of the 1-2-5 session. San Marino's Alex De Angelis, third in the title, just two points behind Perugini, qualified second for the race. Mika Kallio of Finland on a KTM was third fastest on the front row for the second consecutive race. The weather on race day started cold and wet, although it was dry enough for slicks on the MotoGP race. Troy Bayliss crashed on lap four on a slippery white line. He went down heavily and was knocked unconscious, but was declared okay before heading to hospital for a checkup. Rossi then incurred a contentious 10-second time penalty for passing Marco Melandri under a yellow caution flag shown at the crash site, but which may not have been visible. Rossi's teammate, American Nicky Hayden, was having his best race of the year, but soon lost the lead to the world champion. Hayden made a few mistakes, but never stopped trying, as he and the other rising star, Marco Melandri, battled with the more experienced riders. Both are in their early 20s, until Melendry crashed out of a battle for second, dislocating his shoulder. Rossi, fired by the knowledge that he had to win by 10 seconds, put his head down and produced a frantic pace in the second half of the Grand Prix. Meanwhile, Hayden was fighting back from his earlier mistake, getting past Toru Okawa and chasing down Sete Gibbonau. Saturday's crash cost the Spaniard a lot of practice time, and a fall in warm-up meant that he went into the race with his second bike and ran into downshift problems with a gearbox, finishing fourth. Rossi extended his lead to 15.2 seconds. Capa Rossi was smoking his rear tyre onto the main straight trying to catch up, but stood little chance. The action-packed tussle for third went to the last lap, with Hayden pulling a brave move on one of the fastest parts of the circuit for his first podium finish. The top four positions are fixed and cannot change at the final race at Valencia in Spain. Caparossi's lone Ducati standing out in a fleet of Hondas. Earlier, Rolfo grabbed an eight-second lead in the first three laps of the 250 race. With Australian Anthony West in a lonely second place, Fonzi Nieto and Randy de Punier battle for 20 laps for the third place on the podium, and neither seem to have an edge, until de Punier crashed out, unhurt, on the penultimate lap. Roby Rolfo won the second Grand Prix of his career, leading from the first corner to the last, moving up to second in the title standings to keep the World Championship alive. San Marino's Manuel Poggiali finished ninth, but he still leads the title ahead of Rolfo, and the top five positions can still change. It's all down to the last round in Spain. The 125 race was held in varying amounts of rain, allowing many riders to road test their leathers. Local rider Casey Stoner crashed away the lead after six laps, and Stefano Perugini took over at the front until he was reeled in by Andrea Ballerini after a brief dice, 
and also left the circuit with Naprilia full of mud. Ballerini, a former European champion, took his first win ahead of Masao Azuma in an event which was not about who crashed, but who didn't. The mixed results for the leading riders, courtesy of the weather, meant that second position in the championship is still open, with Alex de Angelis now seven points ahead of Perugini. stop to wonder what happens to those winter ski slopes in the summertime? Here's the answer. The Austrian Alps provided the perfect backdrop as over 800 dirt bike riders took part in the Saalbach and Teglem Speed of the Alps off-road festival recently. The six-hour race produced some spectacular action over the most testing terrain imaginable, and some funny, frustrating, muddy, and probably painful incidents too. No doubt the ground will look much more friendly when it's covered with a thick layer of fresh white snow, but recent rain and the repeated passing of hundreds of knobbly tires made sure that this weekend the universal color was brown. Slovakia's Slatko Novosad took the individual prize with 40 laps of the five-kilometer course in the six hours. Austria's Manfred Goldnitzer, with 37 laps, finished second, ahead of Michael Meilhammer, the Italian completing 36 laps. Veteran Austrian snowboarding star Martin Fridermetz completed 34 laps to finish a creditable seventh. Werner Muller and Marcus Tichard took the team relay title, despite a broken chain in the early stages. The Austrian duo completed 45 laps. Their victory owed much to Muller's experience as an enduro rider, which enabled him to fix the chain in quick time. Fellow Austrians Sigi Bauer and Erich Brandauer finished second with 44 laps. Germany's Gerhard Grandl and Gerhard Forster completed 42 laps for third place. The previous evening, there was a special treat for motocross fans with an uphill speed competition to the top of the Reiterkogel. Although the course is floodlit, riders were racing into their own shadows, making it hard to see lumps, bumps, trenches and ditches. A number of elimination heats were needed, each one seeing the course getting more chewed up. Uphill speed competition produced another Austrian winner as Michi Stauffer claimed the first prize of 2,000 euro. So, whether you're happy to win, setting new records, or enjoying your success, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.